as women. And such kind of uh, complaints are not also invalid if you look into the feminist, uh, the history of feminism in India. The, uh, the kind of overview I think, uh, about uh, Indian feminism or feminism in India after reading a few books like uh, uh, Nibeta Menam's Sing, uh, Sing Like a Feminist, uh, Maitri Chaudhuri's Femi Feminism in India and Radha Kumar's The History of Doing, uh, Kumar Chakravarti's Jagging Cast through a Feminist Lens. After reading all these uh, uh, books, uh, the kind of overview I got about Indian Distinguished three major phases of feminism. The first phase being the early 19th centuries, and uh, the second phase, that the complaint was recorded improperly under the Protection of Civil Rights Act, rather than the Prevention of Atrocities on SC and ST Act. But when you look at uh, it, happened in 2006, where I mean the people who came into the streets where only Dalit women and uh, a whole lot of riot happened and police uh, and Dalit men were shot dead by the police and the min, uh, chief minister of the state said that you know there is a uh, Maoist involvement in this case which, which is making more violent uh, uh, which is making the Dalits more violent and if you look at the uh, uh, Delhi rape case which uh, happened in 2012 uh, a girl was raped uh, and thrown away from the bus, the kind of response the media, media, uh, you know, the way the media responded, the way the people responded, they broke out on, onto the streets, and uh, that was really great. Uh, and Urbesh Patel writes, seeing the seeing the the kind of response the Delhi public and the Delhi, uh, you know, the the media did, she writes, I quote, unusually the these protests these. Uh, Unusually, these, these protests included not only women, but also men. They caught across class, caste, really, uh, region, and geography, urban and rural, or semi-rural. And they drew unprecedented media attention both at the national and international levels. Questions were raised in the media, in political forums, in the international media, and indeed at the governmental level. So, you can see the, the, the focus of Indian feminism is not only upper caste or upper class, it is also very uh, urban. And when I am talking about how Indian feminism also has a bias towards caste, uh, <coughs> Anupama Rai uh, in an article, uh, Understanding Siras Gaon. Uh, Siras Gaon is a rare case which happened in uh, 19... It's not a rare case actually. Actually in this case, uh, four women were stripped naked, paraded in the village. Uh, uh, in 1963, but when she went, so we're playing musical chairs here. So we're going to, <laughs> and because we foreigners uh, sometimes, you know, do things that look a bit strange, and sometimes, you know, you may think that it's blunders simply, or because we don't know any better. Um, we are listening first to the two PhD scholars, and then we'll listen to the the associate professors. So I know it's not the usual way. But it's, you know, politically we wanted it that way. So, very pleased to be able to introduce Shivani Kapoor. So, she's pursuing her PhD at the Center for Political Studies at UNU. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So, my paper is titled A Pox Upon Your House The Female Contours of a Dalit Male Autobi Autobiography. I hope it becomes clear, uh, the title becomes clear as I move ahead. I begin the paper with a small snippet of history from the famous Latin American writer and historian Eduardo Galeno from his book called The Mirrors. I quote, In 1847, three novels excite England's readers. Wuthering Heights by Ellis Bell tells a devastating tale of passion and shame. Agnes Grey by Acton Bell strips bare the hypocrisy of the family. Jane Eyre by Currier Bell exalts the courage of an independent woman. No one knows that the authors are female. The brothers Bell are actually sisters Bronte. Intruders into the male world of literature, they don men's masks, so the critics will forgive them for having dared." Unquote. About 150 years later, in 2011, another man, uh, this time Tulsi Ram, writes in his autobiography, Murdhaya, and I quote, uh, I quote in Hindi and then I'll translate. I quote, 
मांस काटने का काम प्राय महिलाएं करती थीं। दादी ये भी बताती हैं कि जिस समय कोई चमार पुरुष मरे हुए जानवर का चमड़ा निकालना शुरू करता अचानक सैकड़ों की संख्या में वहां गीत मंडराने लगते तथा दर्जनों कुत्ते आकर धोखने लगते मरे पशु के मांस के बंदर बाट में महिलाओं के साथ कुत्तों और गिद्धों का उग्र होड़ उग्र होड़ मच जा, मच जाता दादी भी इसी होड़ में शामिल होती थी अनकोट विमेन प्राइमरीली यूज टू कट ऑफ द डेड एनिमल फॉर मीट फॉर कंजम्पन अकॉर्डिंग टू माई ग्रैंड मदर वेन द मैन ऑफ द चमार कम्युनिटी यूज टू स्किन द डेड कैटल दे ऑफन यूज टू बी सराउंडेड बाई हंड्रेड ऑफ वर्चर्स एंड डजन ऑफ डॉग्स At this time, women used to fight these animals to get their share of meat. My grandmother was one of them. Unquote. Dr. Tulsi Ram, one of the foremost Dalit authors and academics, him ended a yet incomplete experiment in self-writing, especially in the Hindi Dalit literary practice. Tulsi Ram's incomplete two-part autobiography. spanning murdhaya and mani karnika incidentally both these terms connote uh, the names of burial and cremation grounds in northern india marks a strong departure from what has now become a standard mode of writing life histories within the hindi dalit literary circuits it is not incidental that i begin the paper with the death death of the author or descriptions of dead animals and their meat nor is it a coincidence that his autobiographies are named after death death indeed will become a recurring me- metaphor for this paper perhaps one of the most decisive turns which these texts take is in providing extremely detailed accounts of phenomenological everyday of the dalit life worlds away from the strictly autobiographical concerns of the protagonists such as the ones uh, such as the one about competing vultures and women read out earlier While many like Sharan Kumar Limbale and Arjun Dangle have argued that Dalit autobiographies are narratives of the collective rather than the individual, Tulsi Ram's writings actually provides the flesh and blood to that assertion. Tulsi Ram, the protagonist, is somewhat effaced in this narrative of his own making. He is displaced as a hero. In fact, in his own admission, and I quote, he is a pox-marked, one-eyed, ill-omened boy, belonging to the Chamar caste. in uttar pradesh the chamar caste were the traditional leather workers from a village near azamgarh in eastern up tulsi ram ultimately goes on to become a professor in russian studies at the jawaharlal nehru university in delhi in this process he goes through the ambedkarite movement the communist movement and finally adopts buddhism never giving up on any of these and yet finding a way for them to coexist This small autobiographical detail, I guess, is very important in understanding the complexity and the layering which he brings in in his own writings. It is in this displacement of the authorial eye from the practice of autobiographical writing that this paper wishes to focus on today. More than simply being a literary ploy, this move also has a powerful political potentiality. By displacing the bio, the life of the autobiographer, as the central moment of the text. space is thus created for the quote unquote others to get in these proverbial others of a male autobiography could be women lesser men affectual contexts thick life descriptions and as in the, as is the case with tulsi ram's writings ghosts spirits the mad the evil and like himself the inauspicious It is these others of a Dalit male autobiography that this paper wishes to explore in order to open up the gender question in what is otherwise considered to be a staid and problematic genre of Dalit male writing. Having said this, the paper today will limit itself to the context of only Hindi Dalit autobiographical literature and in particular the first part of Tulsi Ram's autobiography Murdhaya. Dalit autobiographies have been an important component of the Dalit movement and literature ever since the advent of the Dalit Panther movement in Maharashtra in the 1970s. Autobiographical narratives by the virtue of standing at the curious cusp of the self in the other perhaps contribute most significantly to this process. Though contested, an autobiography is still regarded as the authentic voice of the self, a definitive narrative of the true story. and the reader actually continues to simultaneously partake in the narrative and doubt its truth value while the hindi dalit literary and public while in the hindi dalit literary and public sphere the autobiography is a relatively new type of writing 
The first well-known autobiography in Hindi seems to be that of Mohan. This this comment a little later, and Dadi is an encyclopedia. He he considers his, his grandmother to be a virtual encyclopedia of knowledge. Through his grandmother, Tulsi Ram creates an archive of sorts, which he begins to convince when he begins to convince the reader to believe in her ghosts and in her superstitions. Musaria believes that her husband was killed by a ghost and that a woman's spirit haunts the community well. But then she also knows about the curative properties of flowers and the medicinal importance of cattle horns. She has four vultures to gather meat for her and her family. And most importantly, she knows about bistorias. Bistorias are colonial silver coins stamped with the image of Queen Victoria and thus bistoria in the colloquial. This pot of 37 bistorias is her sole material property. But she cannot count them in the way that you and I can. And allow me a little maths here. Because for her, 37 is a rather unknown concept. It means nothing for her. Being familiar only with numbers up till 10, and beyond 10, all she knows is 20, 30, 40, and so on. So for her, 40 would be dobis, two twenties. That's the only way she can count. And thus, 37 would be dobis metin kam. That is, you know, three less than 240 is the only way that she can count her material property of 37 silver coins. If we, or rather Tulsi Ram, were to deny her ghosts, we would also have to deny this rather delightful archive of knowledge practices and Dalit history, which the Bistoria story brings out. In recording these narratives and not denying them as superstition, Tulsi Ram thus establishes a system of knowledges and memories from within the Dalit life worlds, which are crucial in our understanding of the political and the social in these communities. As readers, we are forced to ask, what would a female Dalit subjectivity based on ownership and accounting of Bistorias look like? A similar question comes up, comes up again when through the grandmother and through other women in the village uh, and also bringing in women from other castes, uh, castes other than his own such as the Musahars, Tulsi Ram raises the crucial political and ethical question of food and hunger. Murdhaya can be read as a veritable archive of Dalit women's battle against hunger a crucial dimension of caste oppression. The practices of food accumulation, dried up meat hidden in animal horns, the invention of suitable food for tiffin boxes of first generation school goers in the family, like Tulsi Ram, the recovery of grain from rat holes, all provide markers for the history waiting to be written. And none of these thick life descriptions have to do with the autobiographical subject of Tulsi Ram per se. It is here that the political charge of his writings comes to the fore. He is not simply complicating the authorial eye of the autobiographical genre, but also complicating what it means to be a Dalit subject of affective history, which has its concerns in hunger, disease, gossip, rumors, and ghosts. The question of affective and emotive histories would also find it impossible to ignore Natanya, the young effervescent girl from the migrant nut community who befriends a school-going school -going Tulsi Ram in order to learn English from him. While many male Dalit autobiographers have talked extensively about the radical potentials of their schooling, they nonetheless seem to forget those who could not make it to school, namely the Dalit women. Murthaya, on the other hand, not only talks about three upper caste women in Tulsi Ram's class, it also contains the fascinating story of Natanya, who never having made it to school, yet claims knowledge as her own. Standing on the margins of society, made inauspicious by her own migrancy, Natanya seems to unsettle the readers because of, mostly because of her uninhibited laughter, her spontaneous dance, but most of all because of her devout rendition of, quote, I quote, vultures are sitting on the tree, the one line in English that Tulsi Ram manages to teach her. It is almost prophetic that the vultures, the symbol of death and burial, and in this case also struggle for food, return to our narrative. While leaving the village to go to college, Tulsi Ram meets Natanya for one last time in the burial ground. In despair of losing her only friend, Natanya forgets how to chant her favorite English phrase. The vultures were no longer hers. Tulsi Ram compares her position in his life to that of Amrapali in Buddhas. In a later interview, Tulsi Ram revealed that Natanya is no longer traceable. Possibly, she could have died. The very fact that both volumes of the autobiography are framed by questions of death 
impending death of the autobiographical subject as well as death as a metaphor for Dalit life was it is a significant move for the otherwise rather canonical framing of the Dalit autobiographical subject in other writings. Borrowing from Uday Kumar's reading of C. Ayappan's stories as thanatographs, one could then propose that in marking the male autobiographical subject with death, Tulsi Ram exposes this subject to uncertainty, instability and fear. This uncertainty in the face of a certain death then leaves large gaps in the supposed continuous and coherent male subjecthood. It is these interstices that the ghosts, the demons and the rumours seep in and begun, begin to become a part of Tulsi Ram's autobiographical self. <laughs> Whoops, hello, yes. Thank you very much. And not only for keeping time absolutely in a perfect fashion, but also for delivering this extremely interesting paper. And particularly, I mean, if you have been quoting from uh, Maya's paper earlier on, I mean, maybe, maybe we can also remember the, the expression, the phrase you used, uh, reading the narrative against the grain. You know, this is probably what we should all be doing. So, thank you. Um, so, I'm very pleased to introduce Shoma, Shoma Sen, um, who is teaching at the Department of English, RTM Nagpur uh, University, so in, uh, in Nagpur. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Judith. I'm uh, reading a paper today on Sushila Tagore. Hello. Yeah. I'm speaking on uh, Sushila Tagore's autobiography, Shikanje Kedart. Actually, I am contradicting what was just uh, said by the previous speaker, not by design, just by chance. Even I didn't know that probably there's been no uh, woman, uh, Hindi woman Dalit autobiography. Um, Sushila Tagore lives in Nagpur, the same place where I come from. And she uh, retired as a lecturer of Hindi, a professor of Hindi from a college there. And she grew up in Madhya Pradesh in a small village near Chindwara and then after marriage migrated to Nagpur and became a lecturer. She belongs to the Valmiki Samaj. So I thought that she's probably the only woman from Valmiki Samaj to write an autobiography. But now maybe we can say that she is the only woman in Hindi to write an autobiography. The title of her autobiography, Shikanjika Dard, is um, pretty interesting because in Hindi there is an idiom which refers to being trapped, a sort of a medieval torture system like a clamp and chains. And so it talks about, you know, the different kinds of pain and torture. And uh, shikanja is also a word for the tongs used in cooking to lift her utensils, utensils from the fire. And uh, it's very typical of women writers to take some kind of metaphors or images of domesticity. So in that sense, it's... it's uh, title that talks about the layers of pain that she has suffered in her life due to her particular caste and gender. Uh, Sushila's autobiography begins, I mean it is a traditional autobiography, it is not like a testimonial of the caste or a, a sociological account. It is a traditional autobiography written in a linear style, beginning with her childhood, her experiences of caste and gender discrimination from childhood, moving on to her marriage and then to her career. But I have tried to take up what you know, one of the participants here was talking about this whole jumble of caste, class, gender, which uh, gets mixed up in, in these kind of issues. I have not treated the work as a literary text to find its literariness and its stylistic features and to some extent I would say that it does lack in those but it's a very moving account of her own life story and it can be seen in a sociological way. So to begin with she talks about her childhood where in school in the roll call she was called as Sushila Harijan as, as they used to you know call out the names. She had to drink water, if she ever had to drink water, it had to be poured into her hands and then trickle down from her hands into her mouth. And uh, she, if she went with her friends to have ice gola at her vendors, then the gola wala would give her this uh, in a paper cup while everybody else got it in a glass or something like that. So she talks about a lot of 
these kind of discriminations which she has faced on the basis of caste in her childhood. She turned out to be the first girl in a village to become a matriculate from the city, from Nagpur, an educated man, Mr. Tagbore. Mr. Tagbore was a kind of leader of sorts. He was a leader of the community who was not exactly an Ambedkarite or a progressive. He probably was affiliated to a caste organization, Valmiki Samaj organization, which was more affiliated to Congress politics, is what I guess, though it's not really written about. But he was much older than her. And due to the forces of patriarchy in her family, having found an educated man from a city, they pressurized her and she also gladly accepted to marry a man <coughs> Uh, quite much older than her and then to migrate to Nagpur. After that began a whole uh, ordeal of patriarchal violence and domination uh, by her in-laws. It was verbal abuse. Her sister-in-law who was separated from her husband came to stay with them. She joined up, the entire in-laws as usual joined up in a, as a gang to exploit her and her husband didn't ever intervene and in fact justified their abuse. They wanted her to use her education so that she could get a job and earn and support this entire group. So her, she became the source of income through whatever job she got till she finally became a professor of economically supporting the entire family. So here was an economic exploitation and here was a patriarchal oppression and then in the outside world there was the caste uh, do domination which she faced. Some of the issues, say for example, uh, about the class issues which are brought up in, in her book, she recalls in her childhood how embarrassing it was for her to accept that they cultivated pigs. Now many of you may have seen the film Fandry and uh, that's wonderfully brought out the horror and the ordeal of such a family who are pig catchers. But this was a real source of income for them because after selling the bristles, they could buy silver jewellery and other things. Sushila writes that if the same, uh, in, in the, the same work was done in the form of an enterprise or as a piggery or as an industry in a westernized way, the way pigs are farmed in Europe, then this work would have been considered to be something respectable. But just because it was associated with her caste, uh, everybody made fun of her and it was something that she had to hide. So here we can see that th the difference of a particular economic activity which gives certain people a certain class status and respectability but because of the uh, stigma of the class, the same uh, economic occupation is looked down upon. Another example from her autobiography is that her brother and father, apart from being with their community work, was, uh, they were sanitary workers. But they often got jobs in other places, so when they worked in a factory. So while working in a factory, all were workers, all belonged to the same class. But when they sat together to eat their tiffin, to eat their meals, nobody would sit with a father and a brother because they were untouchables and they would have to sit separately and eat. Then later on, when she migrates to Nagpur, she gives some interesting examples of caste, class and gender discrimination there. She is by now a lecturer. They are, they are looking for places of accommodation. But because of the caste stigma, it's extremely difficult to get accommodation. Now because of her husband being a social activist, he knows others. And the person they refer to is called comrade and they haven't named him. And they go for, uh, to ask for accommodation, some rented rooms in his house. And the comrade tells them that please excuse me, it's not me, it's not I who think in this way, but it's my wife and my wife is religious and you have to sort of understand that she is going to object to having, you know, the sweeper community, Valmiki Samaj and they are called Mehtar and Bhangi according to their caste name. So, uh, such people living with us. Then she gives another example that alongside in, in the, those sort of rooms in a a row, row house kind of an arrangement. Her neighbor was a woman whose husband had a small cart where they sold pan, the beetle leaves. And they were really poor. But this neighbor, also a woman, would introduce Sushila to everybody else as a sweeper. If anybody came, though she was a professor, if anybody came around asking, you know, who's your neighbor, who lives there, 
Oh, some sweeper lives here. Oh, some bhangi lives here. That was the kind of uh, words that she used. So a woman much uh, more inferior in economic status than Sushila gets the upper hand over her because she belongs to an OBC category. Other, she's also a backward caste, but she's not an untouchable. And not being an untouchable gives her the sense of superiority where she can just dismiss this educated, accomplished lady teaching Hindi in a college as, oh, she's a sweeper. These are sweepers who live here. So the, the whole uh, book is full of such examples. In the college where she was teaching, um, they often sat together on a bench to eat their lunch boxes. Now, another lady lecturer, a professor, is sitting along with Sushila and they are eating together. She is a high caste lady, but Sushila being another colleague, a professor, it's very difficult for her to object that I won't eat with you, I won't have my meals with you. So she sits on the same bench and eats with her. But the sweeper, who is actually the sweeper of the college, another lady belonging to the same caste as Sushila, wants to come and sit on that bench. At that moment, the upper caste woman objects and says, you are a class 4 employee, you are a sweeper, you can't sit on the same bench as we lecturers and eat. And you can imagine Sushila's sense of confusion and contradiction where she knows that on the one hand, on the class basis, and as a woman, she actually identifies with the lady professor. But on the caste basis, and again as a woman, she identifies with the sweeper of the same institute. So the way her whole being, her whole spirit must have been torn apart in these kind of incidents. She notices that there is a habit of people in the college inviting each other for meals. And she invites all her colleagues over for a meal, waits for them. And out of the 13 people whom she has invited, only three turn up. And out of them, only two eat because one of them is observing a fast. So this is modern Nagpur. Because this autobiography was written, I think, 2010 or 12. I just have to check the date. And till today, no one talks about Sushila Tagbhore in Nagpur, really. She has been invited to seminars in London. She has been invited to seminars in Kerala. But Nagpur, no one seems to, you know. He's uh, taken an extract from Boja Tarakam, a leading Dalit activist and lawyer from Hyderabad. Boja Tarakam talks about the primacy of caste. I found this an interesting concept. He has been in the left movement and he has felt that the left movement has actually ignored this primacy of caste, the importance of caste. And uh, to quote him, such is the primacy of caste that it has become a touchstone of a person's worth. Thus, caste, class and gender uh, have become a really a complicated issue and uh, we have seen in the history of the communist movement what has actually happened. There was a time when leading communist people said that once industrialization takes place and a Dalit worker and a high caste worker work together shoulder to shoulder, for example making shoes in Bata shoe factory, then the occupation of the chamar who is supposed to make shoes is replaced by his role as a worker along with an upper caste worker in a factory this will be the end of the caste system or the beginning of the end of the caste system. But it never happened. During the heydays of the communist movement, many Dalits were involved in it and they were also poets. A little while ago, there was a discussion about what is Dalit literature and who is a Dalit writer. So, Narayan Surve was a communist a Marathi poet who was Dalit. Annabhav Sathe was a Matan Samaj uh, that's another so-called untouchable caste poet who wrote general short stories with a leftist kind of an angle. Not uh, the Dalit suffering and all was so much there in the uh, prolific writing, huge amount of writing that Annabhav Sathe did. Even in contemporary India, in very radical politics in uh, Telangana, uh, Shiv Sagar was an ex-Naxalite who was Dalit and Gadhar is a revolutionary ballad singer uh, uh, who is close to the Naxalite movement, who is also Dalit. So Dalits have also been doing all kinds of writing with the left movement, but even there, there has been a lot of uh, angst, a lot of confusion, a lot of debate, people uh, leaving, joining, resigning, and this kind of a trend has been there. Similarly, 
uh, there's been a trend of this in the feminist movement. And here I can again take up another uh, Telangana activist writer, uh, Swarupa Rani, a Telugu writer who's associated with the uh, women's movement, Dalit movement. And I quote from the same uh, book edited by Satya Narayan, where she's written an essay called Caste Domination, Male Domination. In her essay, Swarupa Rani, a Telugu writer, asks, which class of women have benefited from the feminist movement? For the feminist movement in India, all women are the same. But this is far from reality. This is all what she is saying. In our society, which has differences of caste, religion, class, and problems of any group are not the same as that of any other group. And further, in the essay she states, I quote, However evil the patriarchal system in this country is, the more barbarous system is caste. So, on the one hand, we know that Dalit women are suffering both an external and an internal patriarchy. There have been not only incidents of rape, but there has been this entire system of economic exploitation of women and especially Dalit women. Here I would just like to make an interjection that patriarchy is an entire system. It's an institution. It operates in many ways and through many agencies. And it's not a description of men beating women, men raping women. That is not what patriarchy is. In one of the papers yesterday, this point was made that we must recognize that Dalit men are responsible for domestic violence, for using, living off the labor of women like in the Kolati Samaj, where the women are like Tamasha dancers and prostitutes. But at the same time, when we talk a feminist discourse, we are always told women are enemies of women. After all, the women are exploiting women. The mother-in-law exploits the daughter-in-law, tortures the daughter-in-law, etc. To all this, we have to understand that each person is hardly acting. Of course, there is some amount of uh, decision-making process. I'm not uh, wiping out the fact that, you know, it's an individual decision to beat your wife or not to beat your wife. But when you address a problem, you have to address it in its uh, systemic entirety. And if this is the system of patriarchy, it operates in a much more complicated way than this. And therefore this term Dalit patriarchy, I find it very objectionable because it's not the simple patriarchy that Dalit men do, uh, you know, uh, uh, make their Dalit women go through. It's an entire system. For example, Right, uh, uh, Uma Chakravarti has uh, written one of her earlier essays, Whatever Happened to the Vedic Dasi, which is an essay she wrote along with Sudesh Ved. She said that there is this kind of myth that upper caste feminists, upper class feminists and other scholars are putting forward that India was quite egalitarian, it was a matriarchal uh, ancient India and you know the Vedic period, there was a lot more power to women. But it was a slave society and it was a society, ancient India lived upon the labor of the Shudras and it's not just uh, uh, men and women of the upper caste and upper class lived upon the labor of the Dalit women and the Dalit men. So it was a slave society. So whatever happened to the Vedic Dasi goes into that. Thank you very much. Um, so we are going to listen to our fourth and last um, paper on the panel. And uh, just to give time uh, to Vinod to set everything up. So I can say that he is associate professor at the Department of English in one of the colleges at DU University, University of Delhi. Caste and gender in Dalit Hindi writing, in Dalit childhood of Dalit women and Dalit men. Uh, uh, I, I started with topic, but you know, uh, I mean, later on, uh, I shifted uh, my focus and things, you know, got muddled. Uh, and two uh, uh, presentations that uh, refer to uh, in the uh, Dalit writings, in particular, Dalit uh, autobiography by women in in Hindi. Uh, let me share you one of my old beliefs and and thesis, which is still un unexplored, uh, is that. Hindi is a cursed language. Abhishapt uh, uh, or uh, and there are, I mean, as 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 a person from Hindi belt, I mean, I find it 
this language is a is such a subtle language uh, which doesn't have much history. I mean, maybe more than 150 years, and after that, it suddenly falls back on Sanskrit. You know, so uh, I mean, uh, and then uh, in the Hindi belt is you know very very complex area, and uh, the voice of women, uh, not only of Dalit, uh, otherwise. Uh, is almost not heard and uh, uh, feudal culture and values or traditions are very intact and education has hardly had any impact on the cultural and the psyche of uh, human relationships. So whether you have scientists or you have uh, social scientists or all kinds of people I mean, at least my experience uh, in that belt uh, is very difficult to actually see uh, the impact of uh, any modern ideas, particularly equality or, you know, uh, uh, I mean, uh, one may not like uh, modernity and may be critical about it, but at least, you know, this is a good idea for but that too is, uh, you know, not, not available there. And uh, uh, this uh, actually, therefore, uh, takes me to uh, uh, this whole idea of childhood in Hindi literature, you see, Bachpan, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and in Hindi cinema, and in Hindi, uh, you see, Kavya, uh, uh, whether the period of the Bhakti period, you know, uh, where you have a lot of, you know, uh, Bachpan of Krishna and uh, Bachpan of Ram and, 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 and many, many more uh, such kinds of things. So first thing is that this childhood is general, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it, there is a very, very highly rooted general view of childhood and uh, there aren't actually distinctions. And I have experienced it that in the uh, community itself, the word Bachpan or the word childhood is so uh, contentedly and so uh, sophisticatedly used uh, that uh, uh, it actually blurs all the boundaries that uh, create distinction uh, among various kinds of childhoods okay uh, within Dalit community or within uh, upper caste community or within other marginalized communities so first thing is that this notion of childhood is also something that uh, you know uh, complicates the issue of uh, speaking out it later on uh, in, uh, in, in, in the belt. Now uh, mostly you know we uh, take uh, childhood as biological age so which is a question for me uh, because uh, there is you know also uh, with it a cultural age or you may call that uh, whatever you like, emotional age, uh, or, 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 or you may have some other term for that. But you see, uh, the uh, acquisition of uh, you know uh, of one's uh, idea of existence in a particular uh, uh, in a particular in particular circumstances that actually forms you know lot of uh, 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 premises of your thinking. And uh, that thinking, uh, uh, if not supported by, or if that thinking is not actually addressed uh, as, an, as, as a ground of interrogation, then uh, it's very difficult, uh, you know, to really know uh, uh, what uh, one is so far as one's experience with history uh, is concerned, or that aspect of historicity. So normally, you know, uh, historical is very very important in Hindi belt and historicity is almost hidden you know uh, but uh, uh, what has actually happened that in that language you know which is which starts at the bottom from first standard onward in the entire language till your post graduation uh, uh, caste you know and these distinctions have been very systematically erased so that 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 erasure or that deletion, you know, uh, has created uh, a, a silence, you know, in the entire 
uh, in, in, uh, Hindi, particularly so uh, Hindi literature is concerned. So uh, here there is, you know, one very important question: conditions of uh, habitats. In habitat, I count language. You know, human habitat. Uh, 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 food and uh, other things, but after that, you know, language is, you know, something uh, very, uh, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, normally we say it is a medium of communication or something like that, but it's, uh, I think, a very complicated issue. It's something like water. Now, water is medium of something, I don't know, but uh, you can swim it, and you can drink it, and you can also drown yourself and you can commit suicide in it and I mean I mean for me language is not less than water you know it's something you know very made of h2o kind of thing you know so uh, 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 so it's not just medium question you know medium it's rather uh, rather it constitutes your your mind you know it constitutes your personality your it constitutes your relationship with your habitat you know, so in that sense, you know, language is a very complicated issue. Uh, even if I go to structuralism or post-structuralism, you know, in both the areas, at least we haven't uh, touched upon that in Hindi belt. So we are, uh, in a way, you know, uh, 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 we, in a way, we are still traveling too much on the tradition of Sanskrit, you know, uh, as a basis of uh, Hindi language, which automatically supplies and the uh, the searchers automatically, you know, dig out and take those terms and words which actually lead to Sanskritization of Hindi, and uh, of course that uh, 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 that, that, that gets materialized in uh, the, the discourses. So, uh, in that, among the social conditions, uh, I therefore put language as a very important condition, you know, uh, because uh, all the relations and the constitution of the society, I mean. Uh, the way you uh, give meaning to the world, that's very important, you know, aspect. So social conditions uh, uh, are physical conditions in one way, but at the same time, they are conditions of belonging and giving meaning to the conditions. Now, in that uh, transaction, in that transaction, a very different kind of, you know, relationship is produced, and then the acquisition of I, that is, I acquire, the meaning of the word I uh, as a unit of measurement. So uh, I is not different from kilogram or liter or like that, you know. So that's very uh, important. You know, I is, I consider is a, is a unit of measurement, how much weight is, it has, you know. So that, that we use, in fact, in the, in the day-to-day in, 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 in day life. You, you become processes are therefore hidden in the uh, uh, in the social practices and these social practices are traditions and they are glorified and they, then, then no one actually talks of the process for that uh, when you talk of this college or the university uh, when you come out with your uh, annual report when you come out with your uh, uh, admission brochures and when you come out with all kinds of these things in none of the published uh, material whether in the print media or in online there is no reference of the uh, Dalit community that is working in these institutions. Now what is happening in this entire uh, modern interpersonal, interpersonal, intercaste, there is no interculture, you know. You know, so that, that, that interculture or the inter, uh, inter belief system, for example, inter belief system, that doesn't exist. Only inter, inter caste exists. Now in inter caste, most of the times it is, you know, they or both of them perhaps calculate that yes, they can survive and they can buy a flat and they can have a car and like that. Or if they are don't belong to that category, then they should be ready to be hanged in the village uh, uh, by the village panchayat, you know, uh, if that is intercaste in that sense, you know. So intercaste in India means if it is metropolitan, then it means a, a middle class, a middle class uh, house and a small car or something like that. And but if it is in village, then it is just murder, you know. So 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 that that is you know also very important. Now how do we really collect these autobiographies? Actually, that's a very important you know challenge. So uh, I mean uh, I am I am a little bit shifting now, you know, from this entire print media kind of uh, uh, Dalit autobiography in Hindi belt, 
You know, I, I, I've seen that. It's, uh, it's not possible, actually. You know, because there are uh, a lot of murders taking place because of love. You know, so uh, uh, so there you see uh, caste as a, a performance. You know, caste is a performative act, and caste beliefs are texts. You know, caste beliefs are texts, and there is performance, and the text is already written. Written, and of course, you know, if you go to classical Marxism, you know, which is still, uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know whether I use the word correctly, classical, but labor is still there in the world. And at least in the Dalit world, it exists. You know, so labor, uh, therefore, uh, is the basis, you know, uh, of caste and division. And uh, then deeper social structure levels, uh, where you have the patriarchy and the patriarchy as division. You know, patriarchy is what is patriarchy after all? You know, it is also a division. You know, division of uh, of 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 of, uh, of labor in terms of gender, and they uh, they they they. They want to actually uh, construct, you know, gender in a particular sense, you know, gender can then therefore have various uh, 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 kinds of shapes and sizes, but uh, uh, here, here it is more, you know, uh, heterosexual and uh, uh, so gender as, as a division of, of laborers and uh, uh, you know, in that entire network, it's more like a matrix, you know, and it's more like uh, a history where nobody is allowed to speak about one's labor. You know, so labor is there, but there is no voice of it that one doesn't actually tell the process how how one actually performed it. You know, so you have to perform it, and then there will be curtain will be down, and the act is finished, and the drama is over. So next day this will start. The script will always be kept under lock. You know. So uh, uh, this kind of you know. Now in that entire scenario, we have actually come out with some idea. Uh, I am one of the advi uh, advisors of this uh, group, uh, a magazine called Maghar. Maghar is you know you know the town where Kabir chose his death. So he did not want to die in Kasi because uh, Kasi took uh, him to heaven, and he thought it is better to go to hell. Because he had already seen the uh, patriarchs of heaven living in Kasi, you know. So he he, he chose uh, 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 Maghar, and we also in fact support that idea Maghar. So the name of that magazine is Maghar. We have come out with uh, 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 with uh, an, uh, a special issue of the Dalit Childhood, in which several uh, uh, Dalit uh, women writers and uh, men. And we have divided that into two generations, therefore, because it was important, you know. So, first, Nai uh, Pidi or Purani Pidi. Okay, so in Purani Pidi, you all have, you already talked about certain things. Yeah, of course, uh, Tulsi Ram's intervention is altogether very different and that has uh, its own impact. But, you know, we too have actually uh, somehow uh, got a uh, number of, you know, women uh, actually speaking about uh, their, uh, you know, uh, childhood times, you know. So in, in that, you know, you have, uh, for example, Ravinder Kaur, and uh, uh, you have Palasi Viswas, you have Manorama Gautam, Rajni Anuragi, then Vinita Rani, Rajni Disodia, Tabassum, and uh, uh, Poonam Tusamar, and so there are names, you know. It's not like, you know, uh, and, 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 and it, is, it, is all, it is already there. It's, it, it's going to come out, in, I think, in, in, in some time. But you know, most of these, you know, yeah. Oh yes, I, I, I just go ahead. So this is uh, the second, you know, part of uh, of 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 the uh, content page. So uh, most of the beliefs are, you know, yes, yes, yes. You know, so this word is very important for the Dalit childhood, and then great religions and burden of all religions. For example, you know, uh, there is outsourcing of the low caste. India is a very interesting country. For example, uh, water and urine and how much uh, as nightmare, forgetting, remembering, read or not to read, labor, light, ink. So, so these are very important, important things which uh, they all picked up in these uh, uh, childhood ex uh, experiences or autobiographies. So they are all talking about where to go and where to sit in space, time, orientation, disorientation in the classroom itself for example, you know, so you have to first orient yourself then you have to disorient yourself because of the uh, orientation is from the Nehruan vision and the disorientation is from the Gandhian vision within the class, you know, so that, that has to uh, go on 
and uh, 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 cast and then gravity. Cast as a gravity is very important for me, like Earth's gravity and uh, seasons and cast, gender, dreams, etc. You know, and uh, uh, then you see uh, there is another interesting thing is uh, uh, viewing experienced uh, hegemony from bottom and construction of narratives. So I in the same at the same space you have the uh, mimicry by the slum children who uh, you see they have also because the stage is open that they, uh, the, uh, they have left you know because they are taking some rest you know now they have come here now they are going to perform and that will take 60 seconds and I will just go back there <laughs> thank you yeah. thank you yes. yeah. so, so you see so this is all and you saw on the background that's uh, race is happening yeah. <laughs> my turn okay yeah. thank, you. Oh, thank you thank you very much Okay, Vinod was telling me uh, just before he started his uh, paper that he was convinced that women were stronger than men. So here is a proof. But that's also why he's got earrings, but I have earrings too. So. <laughs> Thank you. So we have um, something like five, ten minutes for, uh, for questions. If you have um, any ready questions, so in fact there was but a whole panel on the same genre that is so emblematic of what uh, David writing has been associated with, but in fact cannot be reduced to. So this discrepancy uh, I thought was very interesting, and uh, also this this question of terms that is uh, there. There's been a whole kind of, um, uh, you know, a whole number of different terms that have been used. I mean, we've got life story, account, archive, testimonial hasn't been mentioned, but it could have been. Uh, autobiography, social biography, it was mentioned. Sorry, I missed it. Um, childhood narrative, childhood novel, which again have not been, been mentioned unless I missed it again. Um, so it's all very interesting to see how these uh, interact and intersect. Um, so I don't know if you have you know, something to say about that, or should we just jump to the questions? Don't tell me you're too stunned after a four paper session not to have any questions anymore. Okay, tea's waiting, but tea will wait, right? So you've got to perform first, Lisa. This is a very simple question um, for Vinod. Thank you for your spectacular presentation. Um, in fact, it's a question that is linked to something you said yesterday when you were talking about when poison is in the air, how not to reproduce that poison. And um, I'm wondering if by that remark, because uh, now I think I understand it a little bit better, uh, I'm wondering now if uh, by that you meant this question of the power of language which uh, reproduces, in fact, uh, power systems in such a way that we uh, reproduce it without even being aware of it, even when we are doing something like Dalit autobiography. If you know, I'm lending it this to you. I'll take it back afterwards, okay? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, um, I, I, I will not take any time. Language is like a house. You know? So, uh, I mean, that, that's my, you know, simple metaphor. I use in my classroom because uh, uh, it's always you know language they see it something you know very different you know so if they don't see it as a material reality you know? now they can understand from house as, you know and uh, all kinds of bricks and cements and architecture and wall and roof and all kinds of those things and the space it creates now that space it creates is you know defined you know and now that's language so language definitely you know, is to create space and... <coughs> yes. Where's one? Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. Yes. Um, I just want to uh, thank Shomanam for uh, pointing out the uh, Hindi Dalit autobiography that has come out. See, uh, as a person who tried to uh, teach, say, uh, Limbale's uh, uh, Akarmashi to a few students in Bangalore for two semesters, one criticism that always comes up is about the the common thing about pain and pathos and all that. And again, this question about the um, the way in which 
Dalit society also deals with women and things like that. So, I mean, uh, one tactic that I had to uh, resort to was to uh, look at, say, popular uh, cinema and things like that so that students would understand things in a contemporary situation. Uh, but this autobiography, I would say, would actually help us probably look at the manifestations of caste in the contemporary society, in, say, academic institutions and, uh, you know, in the so-called modern spaces. So, which is uh, very important, I would say. So, uh, and I, would, I really loved your presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Um, this is very general again, which is something that I keep using as a researcher. It's open to any of the speakers. Um, it's about the genre itself of uh, autobiography and the varied criticism it has received, you know, because it is the it is the genre of Dalit writing for the longest time it has been. And as she said uh, very rightly, it shouldn't be reduced to autobiographies alone. My question is this, what is this, um, I find that uh, Dalit writers, um, I'm generalizing here, but uh, uh, I find this very uh, almost obsessive preoccupation with the past in Dalit writing. So um, uh, is this one of the reasons why autobiographies are so crucial in Dalit writing? Uh, because somehow they don't want to uh, move away from either documenting or critiquing or talking about the past? Is, is that one of the reasons or do you think there are other reasons? Um, actually, there's been a controversy in Maharashtra which is uh, sort of contradicts what you're saying that a lot of people started writing autobiographies at a very early age. And uh, Lalit writers, I mean Dalit is counterposed with the word Lalit in Marathi literature. Uh, and critics began saying that how can you call a story of one's life at the age of 35 an autobiography? What is there? So uh, I didn't really feel that it's so much a preoccupation with the past. It was also the present suffering. It's a preoccupation with suffering maybe. And even the book I dealt with, my problem was that, you know, there's uh, hardly any resistance in it. The resistance is very subtle through silence and irony. You know, she doesn't rebel from the domestic violence and leave the family. And I was asking this in a conversation to Urmila Pawar, like, why do you think this happens? And she said, that, what is the alternative? We become outcast of our community. So where do we go? We can't go into the upper caste world as a divorcee woman. They are not going to accept. And then our own community doesn't accept us because of the feminist stance we take. So where do we go? So this has been... Yeah, I would like to add to this that uh, actually, you know, uh, I would uh, past and marginalization are very uh, you know, close. Uh, it's you know, uh, for example, uh, where do Dalits live in a village or in uh, a city? You know, perhaps they live in the past of the town or in the past of the village. You know, the village also has a presence and a past in it. You know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a past and present in it. Houses are past and present, you know, refrigerators and dogs and cows and buffaloes, they are also past and present. So it's a little complicated question, actually. So still, uh, uh, maybe some of them don't understand that, but they have started understanding it. Thank you. Okay, there was one question yeah. here. It will be the last question, sorry. Short, there was, okay. Two. Short questions, short answers. Yeah, Vinodji, uh, what you were saying about the silence uh, in, in the Hindi belt, uh, surely you have to also take it, uh, silence in the printed uh, word, in the form of the printed word, surely you have to also take into account the sheer uh, number of people who have access and the, uh, din and the amount of education required to use uh, the printed word. The percentage, it's a very clear statistics between the Hindi belt and the rest of the country. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, I, I agree. And uh, 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 it's not only, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, I mean, the silence, uh, uh, 
is there in the class itself for example now a class in uh, let's say delhi university consists of 50 uh, students then there are around 25 from uh, lower castes in some sense and almost 15 to 20 uh, 15 students are from un untouchable communities now in that class for entire one year it's very difficult to see a talk happening among them so that silence you know uh, uh, now the books which that we bring in you know most of them fail to address that silence you know and faculties who participate in teaching learning process they hardly learn anything out of that so they only teach you know so that silence always remains there and that is a political agenda you know okay of that uh, educational institution to keep it and that exists in publishing that exists in all, uh, all other areas thank you yeah, I just wanted to add to Shivani's paper. I quite like your paper. Very nice. Um, actually, I think your paper and the text you read has a lot of potential in, in contributing to uh, a certain working definition, if you like, of Dalit aesthetics. In terms of in talking about how the, you know, the protagonist of the Dalit autobiography is never an individuated subject. He or she is always a metonym for a larger community. There's a certain intersubjective transaction going on. And I'm also, I also like the fact that um, about your point about how that this male subject is constantly being interrupted and being, you know, under undermined and supplemented by these other female feminine figures. And it kind of reminded me also of Akar Mashi and it reminded me of uh, Lakshman Gaikwad's Uchali also, right? about how this is constant, um, you know, how is the past being imagined, right? Not as the past, right? But in all its urgent immediacy as the present especially when there's a certain temporality of violence, of loss, of death. You know, it's, it's never the past. Right? So, um, I mean, I'm very interested in the whole question of memory. Memory and childhood especially, as an ethical project of critiquing uh, social norms and castles. Very nice, thank you. No particular answer? Or... Yeah, I Thanks for that comment and thanks for bringing up the question of memory. I didn't have time to go into that, but uh, it's very interesting how uh, Dr. Tulsi Ram actually invokes memory because, uh, like I said, he has a trajectory which leads him to Buddhism and he remained a practicing Buddhist.